Thank you. Oh, man. I, you know what? I can already tell this is going to be good. I think I know why. Because uh, I can tell by looking, this is the exact age group that I wanted for this special. <laughs> There's no one young here. Isn't this great? <laughs> There's no one 22 mixed in the crowd. <laughs> right? Yeah, fuck you. Shut up. We don't want you. I like people that are here, 35 to 70. I can tell by looking at you. Much different. Yes, because we are thrilled to be out. <laughs> Here's a sign you're getting old, and I knew I was getting old. When you go to an empty bar and you go, I love this place. <laughs> right? This place is dead. I think it's my new hangout. Another sign you're old when you go to the beach and you look for shade. <laughs> right? 20 year olds do not look for shade, okay? They try to get melanoma by noon. They're like wrapping their dick and balls with tinfoil. <laughs> 47, I'm like, is that a tree limb? Holy shit, it is. Get all our shit, get it under the tree limb. There's someone going towards it. Cut them off, cut them off! What else do you do when you're getting old? I, I went on vacation this past summer. I look at my weather app. It says that it's gonna rain the next day. This comes out of my mouth. I go, it's supposed to rain tomorrow, but we needed it. <laughs> oh. Shouldn't you need a walker with those little tennis ball halves to say that? <laughs> Needed it. <laughs> this one's even worse. This is how old I am. I'm watching porn recently on the internet. This comes out of my mouth. I go, whoa, it's a really nice couch. <laughs> It's the Maxwell from Restoration Hardware. Ooh. I know, because I did research. I found it, bought it two days later. Highly recommend it, man. Things great, looks great in my living room, and it can take a beating. I played in an over 40 men's softball league. This was sad. Nine out of 12 guys on our team had injuries, right? But we're, but we're all old, so none of the injuries were from playing the game of softball. <laughs> and all I thought was, good thing they don't broadcast these games, you know, because it would sound kind of pathetic and sad to hear, hey, Steve, I don't know if you heard about Joe Matarese. He's the left center fielder. He's going to be out for about a month and a half. Yeah, he tore his rotator cuff, putting a pottery barn desk up into his third-story <laughs> attic last week. <laughs> Yeah, Pete Strumsky, the first baseman, he's gonna be out for a while, too. Blew out his ACL, stepping over a baby gate at two in the morning. <laughs> I don't think this group's gonna make it through that long eight-game season, Steve. <laughs> I'm a dad, I'm a dad. I just wanna say that right at the top. I'm a 47-year-old dad with a seven-year-old and a three-year-old, but is there, there's a lot of acting involved in being a parent. Have you noticed that? A lot of pretending that you give a shit. You don't give a shit, do you? I think I could win an Oscar for some of my performances in my own living room. Like the category would be, and the nominees for best giving a shit in a non-giving a shit situation by a father. Luke's father, Joe, for when he said, yeah, that really is a cool leaf. <laughs> right? And in fearful moments, especially, dads, we can't show fear, we have to act. We could mess our kids up forever. If we show that we're afraid of something. True story, I'm on a flight recently. My seven-year-old sitting right next to me. We're flying to Arizona, okay? About an hour into the flight, we just start hitting this really bad turbulence, right? And I'm just looking at my son, and I'm like... <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. 
Oui. Forty-seven. I think I just hurt my back in my special. Just threw my back out. Too old. I stretch it out. Oh my God! And they won a lot, right? Don't they won a lot? Like this past Christmas, my son hands me his Christmas list. I'm not lying. There's about five thousand dollars worth of shit on his list. And I look at my son and I go, "Hey, you know, you got a lot of really expensive things here." He goes, "Yeah, Dad." But it's Santa, and he makes everything, so it's free. <laughs> and I look at him, I go, hey, I don't know how to break this to you, but I mean, uh, every once in a while, Santa has a shitty month. <laughs> Sometimes he thinks he's gonna win a million dollars on America's Got Talent. And, uh... Next thing you know, he's on West 3rd and McDougal Street. Just saying, he might have to suck a dick on his way home through Newark. It's like, Dad, I, I don't want Santa to have to suck a dick. All right, well, let's start scratching some shit off the list. See that Xbox at the top? Just get rid of that, you know? Replace that with a pair of pajama pants. Then Santa can get away with just giving him a hand job, you know? <laughs> it's crazy, man, with the kids. Like, uh, uh, we have friends that, uh, that hooked us up and gave us their old video game systems. I don't know if anyone has ever had this in their lives. Got these rich friends that are like, dude, just take our old PlayStation 3. You can have it. All the controllers, all the games, everything, right? Give them all to me. Well, this might make me a shitty dad. So I wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> I give it to my kid. But he knew, he knew. My kid's not stupid, you know? It was obvious that it was an old gaming system, you know? It came with Madden 09. <laughs> there were dead players in the game. Yeah. It had Adrian Peterson when he was a good dad, you know? <laughs> Ray Rice when he was an amazing boyfriend. <laughs> All right, I don't know how you guys stand on that whole Ray Rice. It's been the year of domestic violence, hasn't it? It's been crazy. Now, if you're New Yorkers, you probably saw this. There was a viral video that blew away the Ray Rice situation. There's this like 19 year old guy, he's on the subway by himself and he's just kind of on his phone, minding his own business with his headphones on. Did you see this? And there's just a girl swinging at him, just giving him shit. She's like, oh, I don't like your headphones. <laughs> oh, look at your hair, your hair is corny. <laughs> look at your beard, I don't like that beard. <laughs> and he's just taking it, right? But then all of a sudden she swings a little harder, hits his cell phone and it flies across the subway floor. And you just see a switch click in his head. <laughs> I'm hitting this bitch. <laughs> I'm serious, and he just rears back with this like Troy Aikman-like hand. Did you see it? Just rears back, right? <laughs> and he doesn't like hit her shoulder, then the face. I mean, direct bullseye right in the face. And then these guys stand up and they try to defend women's rights, and he beats the shit out of those guys, right? <laughs> And I don't know if this makes me a New Yorker or I'm old and I'm getting jaded, but when he hit her, I just looked at the screen and went, hell yes. <laughs> right? I'm serious. I don't think men should ever hit women. I think it's one of the worst things that could ever happen. But guys should be able to hit one total bitch a year. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'll tell you my total bitch story. And I didn't hit her. This happened, this was when you could smoke in clubs. This woman's waiting for me after my show. And she's got those fingernails that are so long they curl back under. Ever seen these women? She's like, hey, Mr. Comedian. She's just like being rude out the gate. Hey, Mr. Comedian, I didn't like your jokes. I didn't think they were funny. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm done. I don't know what to say. <laughs> and then she had that cigarette with the long ash hanging on it. And she goes, oh, I hate you. And throws cigarette ashes in my face. 
I should have been able to hit that bitch, don't you think? <laughs> right there, just like, poof, right? All the guys at the bar would have stood up, dude, what the fuck was that shit? And I could have been like, easy, it was my one. <laughs> right? Kids, the, the potty training is brutal with kids too. This is gonna scare you ladies without kids right in the front. Kids are potty trained by the time they're about four, okay? But they won't wipe their own ass till they're in their mid thirties. <laughs> right? And then they just yell for you. They don't care what you're doing. Everything's, daddy! Dad, hey! And you start to know the yell. You'll be in the middle of a conversation. Yeah, I gotta go, I gotta go wipe an ass. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was the double dad, that sturdy asshole. I gotta go. I'll be back, I'll be back. I get downstairs, my son is this little neurotic seven-year-old, he's like me, right? He's got his pants around his ankles. He's bent over, I don't know if anyone else's kids do this, they don't just bend. He puts his hands on the ground to get max ass lift. And then he waits for my eyes to meet his eyes. And he goes, how many wipes you think that is? Like I have a PhD in ass wiping. Like, oh yeah, that's about a three. That's a three. What? Didn't see that on the top left. That's like a six and a half minimum. What the fuck? What are you eating hummus and drinking black coffee? It's a mess. And sometimes you just snap. Parents, don't feel bad if you snap in these situations. It's normal. One day I'm just wiping them, right? And I just had enough. I just start freaking out. I'm like, you're seven! This is crazy! Why am I wiping you? Why can't you wipe yourself? He goes, cause it's gross. <laughs> this fucking kid of mine thinks I like it. Oh, it's gross to you? I'm loving this. Oh my God. Oh, that's so good. And you, and you end up doing these weird things with your kids that you would never do as like a, like a young adult. Like you end up in a lot of bowling alleys. I noticed that. As soon as it drizzles, we'll bowl. That'll be good. That's, that should be a sport that costs like nothing, right? I take my kid bowling, holy shit. It was like 50 bucks, two games, okay? My son bowled a nine. Okay. I... I bowl a 37 with the bumpers up, right? You know, but a win's a win. Yeah. That was on. <laughs> and I started thinking about it. I was like, I don't want my kid good at bowling. Bowling is an odd sport. Bowling is the only sport, if a guy was great at it, it could turn women off. <laughs> right? Girls would be like, holy shit, did that guy just bowl a 300? What a fucking loser. Look at him. He's, uh, he's got his own ball and shoes. Oh, the only holes he's putting his fingers in are that bowling ball. Oh. Kids, like how about the car rides? The car rides are brutal, right? They just yell. They just yell the songs they want to hear. That's what they do the whole trip. That's the whole ride, right? And they want it immediately. They know you have YouTube. And I just hear like, boom, clap, XCX. <laughs> Uptown funk, now. What the, like, I feel like I'm doing a shitty radio show. I'm waiting for a mic to come down, a little headphone. I'll be like, hey, how you doing, everybody? This is uh, Joe Matarese. I'm gonna be talking to you for the next three hours. We're gonna be playing all the songs that parents hate and kids love. <laughs> Yeah, I hope you don't want to hear Led Zeppelin, AC, DC, or the Rolling Stones, because we won't be playing any of that good stuff. But I hope you're in the mood for the entire Frozen soundtrack. <laughs> let it go, let it go. Coming at you. <laughs> it's crazy, man. And I, I have two. If you have multiple kids, remember when you just had one? Oh my God, remember how easy one kid was? When I had one kid, all I had to do was drink two beers at dinner. Two beers at dinner, and I was just like, 
<laughs> Where is he going? Uh, he just broke that thing I loved. <laughs> Two kids, antidepressants. Seriously, antidepressants and now the beer becomes whiskey. I was a non-drinker before I had kids. One kid, like I said, beer. Two kids, whiskey. Sipping on bourbon in the kitchen. It's very nice. <laughs> on the computer, drinking a little whiskey. Another true story, my wife comes in. She goes, is that whiskey you're drinking? I'm like, yes it is. She goes, oh, you're so not the man I married. <laughs> So she said to me, you don't say that to a comedian. <laughs> I look right at her, I go, really? You're wearing my sweatpants right now. <laughs> with a hooded sweatshirt on, with the hood pulled so tight, you look like you're on South Park. <laughs> I love you, honey, but let's be honest. I mean, you're not really the woman I married either. I mean, fuck. You know what, Bruce Jenner is closer to being the woman I married <laughs> than you are. To my wife's defense, we both look like shit. That's what marriage is, right? That's what marriage is. You get married, you're like, let's look like shit all the time. If you knock on our door any day of the week, we both look like we're about to paint. <laughs> and the antidepressants are true. I've been on antidepressants, my daughter's three, three years. That's how long I've been taking them. Highly recommend them, okay? If you're trying to raise kids without medication, you're making a huge mistake. This is how great my meds are. Right now, I feel like tonight's show could be my big career break. <laughs> it was. You gotta get these meds. My doctor prescribed them. He said, Selexa, Joe. 20 milligrams, right? But I'm kind of cheap. So I said, hey, can you up that? Up it to 40 milligrams. You ever do this? And then you break your pills in half. One copay, now you got two months of meds, right? <laughs> yeah, but I'm kind of an idiot. I didn't know that you should go to a pharmacy and buy one of these little pill cutters to make the nice precise cuts. People in their 60s and 70s, if you're here, you know about cutting your pills with the little pill guillotine? Perfect cuts. I'm 47, I'm breaking pills in half in my kitchen with my thumbs. One day I'm on an eight milligram. Next day I'm ODing on a 32. One and two milligrams rolling around on the kitchen floor. My seven-year-old thinks they're candy. Oh, there's Pez on the floor. It's all candy here. About five weeks later, he's like, hey, Daddy, uh, I don't need any more toys. I'm good. <laughs> and when you start taking an antidepressant, you start realizing other people in your family are on medication, right? Like, I started finding out later in life that my dad has an anxiety issue, right? Unmedicated, you know, he's old school Italian, he's not gonna medicate it, you know, but he, but he has anxiety. And I never knew about it, because he's, he's in his early 70s, and that generation of people didn't tell their kids about their inner workings, right? I'm in my late 40s, I'm honest with my kids, that's the new way to raise kids. I have breakfast with them every morning. My three-year-old daughter, my seven-year-old son, I look right at him, I go, listen, your dad's got mental problems. <laughs> there's a good chance you guys might have some mental problems. So what do you want, Fruit Loops or Rice Krispies? You got your choice. One day I'm driving my seven-year-old to first grade. I'll never forget this. I just look at him, I go, hey, <laughs> just wanna let you know, you might feel the walls closing in at some point. I didn't find out my dad had this anxiety thing until my 40th birthday. I, I planned a cruise with my dad and I. It's something you do earlier in your early 40s. I don't know if anyone's there yet, where you're like, I'm gonna plan a trip with just my dad, right? You sound like, you, it sounds like a great idea. You're like, it's gonna get us close. It's gonna be awesome. Three days into the cruise, I'm like, fuck, I think I wanna break up with my dad. <laughs> I wanna see other dads. 
gotta be somebody better for me than this guy. We start pulling away from land in Fort Lauderdale. I'll never forget it. He's looking out the porthole on the ship and he just starts going. <sighs> oh my God. <sighs> I'm like, dad, what's going on? He's like, I don't know. I think I'm having one of my anxiety attacks. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I've had an anxiety problem most of my life. That's what he says. I go, why would you never tell me about that? He goes, ah, thought it might have skipped a generation. <laughs> I'm like, asshole, this isn't Teen Wolf. <laughs> That's why I need the crowds to be older. You're in your 20s, you didn't get that Teen Wolf joke. <laughs> She's like, is that a show on MTV? No, it's a movie with Michael J. Fox. It was a classic. His dad was a Teen Wolf. Now, my dad, my dad would get pissed if he heard me say this, but my, my dad and I, we're not really, we're not really Italian Italians. I don't really, I'm not like, you know, I'm not. I know like 12 guys that own pizza shops. They don't even say hello, they just go. Now, my dad and I, were not really that, like, Italian, you know? Like, this is how non-Italian my father is. True story. He caught me watching porn when I was 16 in our basement. Never forget this. This is what he says. He starts yelling. He goes, hey, shut that off. It's Lent. <laughs> Can't make this shit up. And when I was younger, I lived near South Philadelphia where all the real Italians were. And I used to want one of those really goombaed up Italian dads. I did. I would have loved like a Tony Soprano father. Like Tony catches his kid watching porn. It's a different thing, right? If he would have caught me watching porn, Tony would have been like, oh, what the fuck is that fucking porn? <laughs> That bang but seven? Oh, it's a fucking classic. <laughs> Good for you. I'm fucking proud of you. You fucking tits on that boy. <laughs> Your mom don't got tits like that. <laughs> uh, my Puerto Rican gourmet in Jersey City does though. Not all. <laughs> my dad is classic, you know? He, he didn't mentor me either. The, that generation of, of Italian father didn't sit down and give life lessons, you know? But I'm 100% Italian, and I grew up 10 minutes outside of Philadelphia, okay? If you're Italian and you grow up near Philly and your dad doesn't give you advice, you still have Rocky. <laughs> right? Right, Italians, are you here? We're the Italians. Oh my God. Nice. Yes, now Rocky's very serious to us, right? There were subtle life lessons in all those Rocky movies, but you had to pay attention to see them. Now the first Rocky has a scene where Rocky can't sleep, he can't stop thinking about the big fight, and he, he gets up and he goes, to the, he goes to the spectrum where he's gonna fight Apollo Creed. He goes the night before the fight just to walk around the empty spectrum, he's just looking. That's what I did with the Village Underground. I've been here since <laughs> two, last Tuesday. <laughs> You doing my special soon? Yeah, it's about a week away. <laughs> then he goes home. He gets into bed with Adrian. I don't know if you remember this. He looks at her and he goes, Yo, I can't read Apollo. <laughs> what are you talking about? I can't win, Adrian. I either really want to win, you know? All I really want to do is go the distance. <laughs> No one's ever gone to this is with Creed. I mean, if that bell rings, and I'm still standing, I'm gonna know for the first time in my life. Yeah, I'm, not a, I'm not a bum from the neighborhood. And I was like, man, that is a subtle life lesson. Go the distance we can all use in our lives. It's genius, because if you're a parent or you're just a husband or you're a wife, you don't really have to be great at it to be good at it. All you have to do is not leave. <laughs> right? 
But some people can't pull that off, right? Famous people bail easily, right? Famous people have like a shitty lunch with somebody, ah, oh, we gotta end it, and then just over, right? You gotta go the distance. Everyone knows marriage has nooks and crannies, right? It's like good for like a week, then it blows for six months. <laughs> then it gets good for an hour, then it sucks for a year. <laughs> then your wife goes down on you after a comedian special in New York City. <laughs> now you're back in, now you're back in. You gotta go to distance. Rocky IV, he's a little less subtle with his life advice. Rocky IV, he's like, yo, if I can change, then you can change. <laughs> Does anybody can change? <laughs> All right, we got that one. All right, I'm with you. But one thing you never learned during any of those Rocky movies was how to box. <laughs> Rocky didn't block a punch for six films. Every Rocky fight was the same. He's like... <laughs> this guy had the fighting technique of Glass Joe from Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Like... <laughs> All right, you like the impressions. So let's keep a couple going. Now, you don't even need to be a Philadelphia Philly fan to know who Harry Callis was, because he used to do uh, all the narration of NFL films, and he used to do, you make the call on Monday Night Football. Now, when he was the Phillies announcer, he was the best, especially when the Phillies sucked, because he had a whole different tone to his announcing. <laughs> I swear, I remember turning on the game once, and I hear, up to play third baseman, Scott Rowland. Swinging a lacing ball down the third base line, incoming to score the whole team, and the Phillies still fucking lose five to four. <laughs> Love Harry. All right. But we're in New York, so we got it. I guess we have to do uh, Bob Shepard, late great in stadium announcer for the Yankees. Now, uh, my first roommate, when I moved to New York, worked for the American League, and he used to get me free tickets to all the Yankee games. And I started falling in love with Bob Shepard, you know, because he would say everything twice. I used to love it. Now batting, number two, shortstop, Derek Jeter. Number two. <laughs> I was like, I love that. He says everything twice. This guy's great. Maybe I'll propose to my wife at a Yankee game and get him to do it, you know, because he would do a lot of these proposals. But then I thought about it, I was like, holy shit, you can't do that. I always have shitty seats when I go to Yankee <laughs> games. That would kill the romance to hear, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd all look to the upper tier, <laughs> behind the foul pole, in the obstructed view seat section. <laughs> A young man is proposing to his girlfriend. Ooh, and she says no. <laughs> she says no. <laughs> now, my mom has the anxiety too, but Italian moms, forget it. They would never take medication either. They're not gonna take it. You should have been there when I called my mom and told her I was taking an antidepressant for anxiety and depression. She goes, oh my God, why don't you just take a long walk and eat a meatball sandwich? <laughs> Seriously, like you can walk off depression. You know? oh, I'm feeling kind of sad. I'm gonna go down West Third and take a stroll. <laughs> Is that a subway? Zip did he do da? <laughs> and she's just as anxious as me, but my mom doesn't have a minute to feel an emotion because she's one of these people that's never not cleaning. That's an Italian mom too, right? My mom's always wiping shit down. It's, it's, it's Christmas. She's like, oh, I gotta get that. Gotta get that. We're sipping wine. I look over. My mom's on a step stool cleaning the ceiling fan with a rag, just like. <laughs> Mom, would you chill out? Jesus, relax. You know who's relaxed? Dirty people. Right? Dirty people are the best. 
<laughs> you ever hang with them and you show up at their house you're like, hey! What's up? Come on in, man! You wanna sit out, move the cat hair. Just move it and sit. But at some point in your life, and I think this is the late 40s, you lay off your parents at some point. 46, it happened to me. I was like, why am I blaming my parents for me? I should be blaming my grandparents. Because they fucked them up. Did you ever watch an Italian grandmother at work? Oh my God, they could destroy anybody's self-esteem. They're brutal. That show Jersey Shore about young Italians, huge mistake if you ask me. Huge mistake, young Italians, because they turn it on for the camera. I got the situation, look, the situation, shut up. You're doing that because the camera's on you. Old Italian people, they don't change. They have one way they're gonna be. That should have been the show. Take six Italian grandmothers, <laughs> over 85, put them in one house together at the Jersey Shore, okay? <laughs> and here's the kicker, one black guy in the house with them. Yes. The show's called Did She Just Call Me Colored? <laughs> now, my, uh, my grandmother's 94 years old, still alive, still alive. She has Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you've ever watched any of your elders get Alzheimer's disease, there's comedic moments. And here's what's comedic. They have vivid memory for things that happened like 65 years ago, right? I'll be hanging with my grandmom. Out of nowhere, she'll be like, oh, I remember June 9th, 1940. Yeah, it was breezy that day. I felt a chill, so I started knitting the second afghan to stay warm, and you know what? It worked, it worked. But she won't remember what she said eight seconds ago. And I promise you, if she's an Italian grandmother, what she said eight seconds ago was negative, <laughs> evil, and very racist. And now she's on this evil loop that just keeps going round and round. I'll never forget it. I called her on her 90th birthday. I was in Cleveland doing a gig. I call her up, I'm like, hey, grandmom, it's your grandson, Joseph. Happy birthday, you're 90, can you believe it? Wow, long pause. And then she just goes, where are you? <laughs> I'm in Cleveland. I hope you're not doing comedy, because that's a waste of time. <laughs> Actually, I am doing comedy. Oh, Jesus, Criminy Joe. You should be home with your wife and kids. I told you when you were young, you should have learned to trade. Oh, my God. Oh, how'd you get to Cleveland? I drove. You drove your car all the way to Cleveland. Jesus Christ. Where are you? <laughs> it's all over now. Uh, you would think just once I would learn how to use her Alzheimer's disease to my advantage, you know? She's like, where were you? Um, I just got home from my welding job. <laughs> 15 years in the union today because of you, Grandma. I love you. Gotta go. Click. <laughs> I have triggers for my anxiety. I think a lot of us here in the Northeast, we have triggers. It's usually weather in the Northeast, right? Right? Every winter, we're like, in mid-shovel. Fuck it out of here! <laughs> Can't take it anymore! We're moving to Florida, right? But if you're from the Northeast, as soon as you get to Florida, you're like, it's hot as shit here! <laughs> it's too humid! Then you use this word, it's muggy, right? It's a little muggy. My dad loves that one, it's too muggy. Shut up, it's your muggy. It's freaking 84, it's nine back home, shut up. I, 
I am. I'm a weather guy. I get anxious. I remember like three years ago, we had 39 inches of snow in the month of January. You know who I blamed? I blamed my wife. Because <laughs> my wife talked me out of buying a snowblower that December. I had it. I was pulling it up. Did you know you can't go buy something when you're married without getting your wife to pull up your finances for the year? She figures out if you can afford it in that moment. When I was just a guy, I'd be like, I want a snowblower, getting it, you know? <laughs> now I got my wife who cuts me off. She's like, where are you going with that? Where are you going? <laughs> I wanted to get us this. She goes, we don't need it. I'm like, yeah, I think we do. No, we don't. We can just hire a guy every time it snows. That's what she said. Yeah, 39 inches. There was no guy. <laughs> How much that's the snow for Mexican people not to want to work? <laughs> Very positive racist joke. They're hard to write. Right? Even Mexicans are like, shit, that's a lot of snow, bro. <laughs> shit, you should have bought the snowblower, man. <laughs> Does anyone have the wife who doesn't help with the shoveling? She just waves from the picture window with the kids in her hand. Wave to daddy, wave to him. You're shitting me. Put some boots on, bitch, are you serious? I don't even wanna live in this house. We're near your whole fucking family. I don't even own a scraper for my car. Does anyone do this little white trash move? You stick your arm outside the window, you do it, and you scrape into the snow and the ice with your fingers, then crank the defroster up and wait for that hole to get big enough. And I don't care who you are, we all get impatient with the hole. We're all like, ah. I can make it, I can make it. I don't need to look left to right, that's overrated. 6 a.m., there'll be nobody on the roads. Got my own little periscope, I'm good. And I have to drive my kids to school every day. And I have to get them dressed while my wife goes off and gets us medical benefits. Very important when you're on as many pills as me. You need those benefits, man. That's my job, to get them dressed. I don't know, that's the hardest thing you ever have to do as a parent. What is wrong with kids? They don't want us to dress them. They go against us, right? I'll be like, here, here, got your, got your sneakers. My son's like, oh, I don't want those sneakers. What are you talking about? I want my light-up sneakers. Those are two years old, they don't fit you anymore. And then they do that hyperventilating cry where they're just like. <laughs> you think they swallowed a marble? Can you breathe? <laughs> I want my light up sneaker! <laughs> when you're a husband, what do you do immediately? You're like, is my wife around? She's not. Who gives a shit? And then you just start cramming them on his feet. <laughs> They're on. They're on. Now put your underwear on. I got your underwear. I want those. I want my Batman underwear. <laughs> you pissed all over your Batman underwear two days ago. <laughs> I want my Batman underwear! All right, let me get him out of the hamper. I'll be right back. All right, they're a little damp, but we can blow dry them. We can blow dry them. We'll make it work, right? Because your job as a dad, you don't care about all this shit. All you want to do is get him in the car seat and get those belt buckles clicked in. There's no greater sound for a parent than hearing the car seat belt buckles click in, right? As soon as you hear the second click, like, click, click, 
We are going! I look like Tiger Woods after a 40-foot putt. I finally got it clicked in. Now I get into the front seat. Now I got to get him to school. I got to get down the driveway, get him to a school safe and sound, right? And I'm looking out the hole, right? Got to get him down there. So my son yells from the back of the car, Joe! <laughs> Joe! Your kids, they'll call you by your first name. It hurts, doesn't it? It's so hurtful. When you hear your name called, you just want to look at him and go, are you serious, Joe? Do you know how many up the back shit diapers ears I changed? I've wiped your shoulder blades with diarrhea. One time I ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with your poop under my fingernails. I love you. Your poop is my poop. And he's back there, Joe, would you just go? Just go, Joe. Right? And this is before I was on Selexa. Right? I snap in the moment. I'm like, where the fuck do you have to be at seven years old? Please be up windows. Please be up windows. My wife is a psychologist. It's pretty classic, huh? And I'm a mental patient. Wow. <laughs> Opposites do attract. My wife told me she diagnosed me with ADD on our first date. And she didn't tell me I had it until we were married. For four years. Right, wives? That's how you do it. Remember when you were dating him, you thought all his weird little quirks and tics were kind of cute? All his little weird habits were kind of fun when you were dating him, right? That's how my wife was. When we were dating, my wife used to be like, oh my God, you don't remember that? It's so funny. You don't remember things. <laughs> right? Four years later, she's like, asshole! You have ADD! You need to go see a psychiatrist, get some medication. I'm sick and tired of repeating everything that I said. You suck! <laughs> And when your wife makes twice what you make, you're like, okay, well, what day is the appointment? <laughs> True, two days later, I'm in a psychiatrist's office getting an ADD test, right? Holy shit. Best I ever did on a test. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. First question on the ADD test. The doctor goes, hey, when you read, do you get tired? I'm like, when I read, I feel like I got shot by a blow dart. <laughs> I can't even read bedtime stories to my kids. I'll be like, brown bear, brown bear. <laughs> Purple horse, pur <laughs> Question two, Joe. When you go to the movies, do you fidget in your seat? Like, when I go to the movies, I look like Ray Charles when he was coming off a of heroin. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions into this doctor's test, it started to feel so specific to just me. It felt like the doctor was going, hey, do you drive a silver Subaru Forester? <laughs> do you live in a house you hate that's near your wife's friends and family, nowhere near anybody that you know? buy a shirt for $150, you're gonna return the day after you do your one hour special. <laughs> Are you Joe Matteris? Yes, I am. Well, you have ADD! You're like, yeah. Sucks having ADD when you're with a psychologist, right? Because that's the opposite of ADD. That's a professional listener. My wife listens so well, it's frustrating. You ever been with someone like that? Another true story, I go to Vegas. It's my brother's bachelor party, and I gotta make the check-in call to my wife from the Vegas bachelor party. <laughs> Three seconds in, she goes, you don't sound like yourself. <laughs> I'm like, 
uh, maybe that's because nine of my friends are in the other room yelling faggot. <laughs> true shit right there, that really happened. I have a wife that makes more than me. I don't know if there's any husbands out there that have the wives that make more. Where are you? We need to start like a support group. Look, we, it was just a sad hand raise, you see? So. It's brutal, right? Do you have friends? I have friends that think I struck gold. Our friends are like, dude, your wife makes more than you. That's awesome. Like, you don't get it. When you have a wife that makes more than you, you know what else you have? A wife that talks to you like she makes more than you. <laughs> you don't ever want that, right? No, I have a friend that makes so much money that his wife had a law degree that she no longer uses. She actually said this to me one day. She goes, you know, Joe, I was only making 160,000 a year and I quit because it really wasn't helping us any. That put me in a bad mood for a summer. I'll never forget it. Just walking down random streets. I was only making 160,000 a year, so I kept it. I wasn't really having it any. Pre Selexa would just snap. Fucking unbelievable, man. This guy makes so much money that he can come up with spur of the moment ideas and get away with it, right? I'm over his house this past football season, Philadelphia, five of one on a Sunday. He just looks at his watch. He goes, shit, Joe, game's starting in about five minutes. What do you want to do for the games? I'm like, I don't know. We could go in your home theater, watch them on your eight foot 3D IMAX. That'd be fun. He just looks at me and goes, dude, screw it. Let's just go to the game. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, we can be there in 25 minutes. My company has its own private box. We'll eat for free. We'll drink for free. It'll be unbelievable. Honey, honey, uh, Joe and I are going to the game, all right? Yeah, watch the kids while we're gone, and we come back, have an amazing dinner ready for us. We'll be starving. See ya. Just walks out the front door. <laughs> now, I'm standing there in front of my wife, like, Am I allowed to go with him? <laughs> Please. I'll, I'll rub your back for like four hours when I come back. No power whatsoever in my marriage. I have none. How do you get power if you don't make as much money as, as the woman? What do you do? I have options. These are two tips of advice for me. First option, it's a good way to do it. Marry non-American. Yes. And I, I base that joke on one couple. That's, that's the way I write my material. I watch something happen once and I go, that's everybody. And I do the joke. This one's based on my wife's cousin, okay? My wife's cousin married a Brazilian woman. We shared a summer rental with them in Cape Cod for a week. This woman he married shows up, nine months pregnant, cooking and cleaning for all 10 of us in the house, right? Disciplining everybody's kids all at the same time and somehow pulling off muscular, nine months pregnant. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I had to pull her aside. I'm like, how are you pulling this off? Her exact words, she goes, Joe, believe it or not, in Brazil, we were taught at an early age to be great wives. And I was like, <laughs> like, my wife was taught at an early age to teach her husband how to be a great wife. <laughs> I am a very good wife, I gotta give myself credit. You gotta see me fold, it's unbelievable. Fold and flatten, then fold and flatten. I nail it. I nail it. So what's the last tip? This is for single guys. I don't know if this looks very coupled up. If there's any single guys here, this is what you need to do. You'll be happy forever. Find somebody beneath you. <laughs> in every category. I'm serious. See, you don't like the way that sounds. Because when you're young, you're like, I need a 10. No, you don't. You don't need a 10. You ever been walking down the street? 
and you see a gorgeous person with a hideous person, and you go, oh my God, what the hell are they doing together, right? I figured it out. The gorgeous person loves freedom. Yes. If you're a nine and you hook up with a one, you can do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> she might try to stop you early in the relationship, right? At the beginning, she might be like, hey! Get over here! I don't think you should go on that long golf trip with all your friends. And you could be like, yeah, whatever, one, and you just walk out the door. Put your golf bag on right in front of her. See you later, yeah playing the best golf of your life that next day, too. Because you're relaxed, right? You're just down the middle, right down the fairway. Boy, I'm on fire. There's another one, right? You're not stressed out. You're not sitting on the tee box looking at your friend like, I hope my one's not still mad. <laughs> In the woods. And then I started thinking, I'm like, is that why John Lennon's second wife was Yoko Ono. <laughs> yeah, I'm a John Lennon fan, but if you Google him like I did, his first wife comes up and she's very attractive, beautiful woman. But even John Lennon at some point was like, I can't fucking take her anymore. <laughs> <laughs> fucking gorgeous bitches torture, man. <laughs> Just made me cancel my tour to Antarctica. What the fuck am I gonna do wrong there, man? And he got rid of her, right? And then some time went by, and he met Yoko Ono, right? A negative six. <laughs> and not American. I'm just saying, John Lennon was more than a musical genius, everybody. Thank you guys so much, you were unbelievable. Everybody.